Do you think we should focus our efforts more on Facebook or on Twitter? You know, my gut says that we should focus... Hey guys, we're talking about social media? Yeah, we were just about to. Mm, yeah, it's a tough decision to make. You know what, we should have a meeting about that. Oh, I think Marsha and I got it. To the boardroom! Okay, great, so Facebook versus Twitter. Well, first, Facebook has photo albums, while this one only lets you have 140 characters. Now, granted, there is Instagram, but that is actually owned by Facebook, but you can actually link it to Twitter. Do you think I should get something with lumbar support or like a yoga ball? Oh, definitely. Boardroom. Come on. Pro lumbar support. Back. Yoga ball. Well, you got a ball. Everybody loves balls. They're fun. So, I don't know. I think I'm gonna go, like, short, short. Yeah. You know what? I think that all leads back to success, self-esteem, slam dunking, and high-fiving. Because lately, I feel like maybe it's the work that What's we've been doing. What's this meeting about? Great question. Let's get L.A. on the phone. Get them in the boardroom. Ha 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 ha! Well, this morning I'm concluding the message series called Making the Right Choice. Decisions are never easy, and choices are especially difficult when we have to make them in the middle of a pandemic. The uncertainty of what lies ahead frustrates us because we don't know what to do. Is this the time to be stingy or generous with my money? Should I visit a family member in another state, or is that too risky? Should I send my children on campus to school or keep them home and do virtual school? For the past several weeks, we focused upon key decisions that every person makes in life. And for all of these life decisions, the Bible makes it clear that there's both a right choice and a wrong choice. So our goal has been to focus on these key decisions and learn how we can make the right choice. Today, I want us to talk about choosing forgiveness over bitterness. Have you ever been wronged by someone to the point where you were boiling over with anger and bitterness? There will be moments when every person will feel like he or she has been treated unjustly by another person. That offense may come from a family member who wrongs us, a friend who betrays us, an employer who undervalues us, or an acquaintance who misunderstands us. And every time an offense takes place, we have a choice. We can choose to forgive and let it go, or we can choose to hang on to that offense and become bitter. Bitterness is the attitude that refuses to forgive people. It allows hate, anger, jealousy, and fear to linger for long periods of time. Bitterness starts out small. An offense takes place, and we choose not to let it go. Instead, we replay it in our mind over and over, day after day. We share our hurt with any available listener, recalling every sordid detail. One negative thought leads to another, and soon we're tossing and turning at night, recalling the scene and making plans to get even and settle the score. Bitterness holds on to anger and seems ready to explode at any moment. A person who's clinging to bitterness is often resentful, harsh, cold, and unpleasant to be around. Bitterness has the power to destroy us from within and to negatively impact every person in our life. So it's no wonder that the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4.31, get rid of all bitterness. The Bible also warns us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. A bitter root can take over your heart 
and take over your life. So what's the cure for bitterness? The cure isn't to get even and equal the score. The solution is not to give the other person a taste of their own medicine. The cure is forgiveness. The solution is to offer grace to the offender. If you have your Bible this morning, I invite you to open it to the New Testament book of Ephesians chapter 4. Paul writes about choosing forgiveness over bitterness in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. Paul writes, beginning with verse 31, Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and considerate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Jenny was 92 years old when she died. For the final 50 years of her life, she told a story over and over about the time when her sister did not give her the dollar she needed for a pair of shoes. Jenny recalled this story in such vivid detail that it seemed like it happened just a few days ago. And every time she retold the story, the message came across loud and clear. Jenny would never forgive her sister for withholding that dollar from her. Do you have anyone like that in your life? Someone you need to forgive, but would rather not forgive? Maybe it's an ex-spouse, a parent, a relative, a teacher, someone who did something to you that no one knows about except that person, yourself, and God. Maybe somebody messed you around in the business world and said some nasty things to you and about you. Maybe someone cheated you out of some things or stole some things that rightly belonged to you. It could be that that person who offended you died many years ago. Or this could be something that's still ongoing. Uh, A back-and-forth battle between you and your spouse or one of your grown children, or a relative, or a roommate, or a co-worker. Perhaps things have gotten so bad and have progressed for so long that your relationship with that person is now severed. Just thinking about that person stirs up anger, heartache, and all kinds of negative feelings. You avoid him. You do your best to ignore her. You try not to think about it. Forgiveness. It's the gift that everyone wants to receive, but finds so hard to give to others. It's not easy to forgive. Yet forgiveness is one of the most important choices that you get to make in life. To forgive or not to forgive. It's a choice that will have lasting consequences for your spiritual, emotional, and physical health. How's that? If you don't forgive, you'll become a bitter person. You'll become an angry person. You'll damage your relationship with God, and you'll even damage your physical health. But if you courageously make the choice to forgive, You'll become a gracious person. You'll become a person who's filled with life and joy. You'll become the kind of person that other people want to be around. And you will connect with God in a very personal way. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness acknowledges that an offense has taken place and then makes the choice to dismiss it. The Greek word translated forgive in the New Testament basically has the meaning of to send away or to let go. To forgive means to let go of the hurt and the right to get even. Instead of making plans for revenge and to pay someone back, you let it go. 
It's like making a fist. And this fist represents something you're hanging on to. It symbolizes the resentment, the anger, and the bitterness in your life. The word forgive means to release, to let go. It means to unclench your fist and let all the negativity go. And as you're letting it go, you say a prayer to God that sounds something like this. Heavenly Father, I forgive him. I release her. I cancel the debt. I'm not minimizing what took place. I'm doing what you asked me to do. I'm letting it go. This is hard for me. So I'm asking you to help me forgive the people who have hurt me in my life. Amen. You may be thinking, I don't want to forgive. Forgiveness is so unnatural. When somebody hurts me, damages me, or says something bad about me, I want to get even. I want to get them back. And when somebody suggests that I forgive them or release them, that flies in the face of every instinct that I have. There's a lot to be said for not forgiving. I mean, why should someone just cut their way through our life, leave us bleeding, then ask us for forgiveness and for us to pretend that nothing is wrong anymore? I mean, forgiveness seems like such a ripoff. Why should I let them off the hook? They don't deserve it. The Bible tells us to forgive people. Why? Why should I forgive? What reason or benefit is there to forgiving the people who have hurt me? Today I want us to focus upon two reasons. The New Testament tells us to forgive people. People. Number one, we forgive because we are forgiven. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, that we are to forgive each other just as in Christ God forgave us. Paul also writes in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, forgive as the Lord forgave you. We forgive people because God forgives us. One day, Simon Peter asked Jesus a question that's recorded in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Jesus, where do I get to draw the line? When can I say enough is enough. The Jewish rabbis drew the line at three offenses. If you forgive someone who hurts you three times, that's the most you're required to forgive. Simon Peter must have considered himself a spiritual guru when he suggests to Jesus that he forgive seven times. Can you imagine forgiving someone seven times? But then Jesus chimes in in verse 22. I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. In another passage, Jesus' answer is recorded as 70 times seven or 490 times. Wait a second. Who has time? to keep track of 77 or 490 offenses. I mean, that's such an unnatural line. Who can forgive like that? Jesus tells a story that's recorded in Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 through 35. A wealthy king finds out that he has a servant who owes him a lot of money. This servant owes the king a ridiculous $10 million. So one day the king calls the servant into his office and says, it's payday. 
pay up. Show me the money. The servant doesn't have the money and will never have that much money. So the servant begs for mercy. And in response, the king does something crazy. He cancels the debt and sets the servant free. <laughs> Can you imagine owing someone $10 million and having them cancel the debt? I mean, that is crazy. Now, you would think that this forgiven servant would become a forgiving person, but not so fast. He finds a fellow servant who owes him $20, and he starts choking the guy. Pay up, buddy. And when the guy can't pay, he has his fellow servant thrown into jail over $20. That, too, is crazy. What's the point of this crazy story? Our Heavenly Father is the king in the story. You and I are the servant who owes God a huge debt. Every time we break one of God's laws, we incur a debt. Every sin equals a debt. And even if you only sin three times a day, that's over 1,000 sins a year. And by the time you reach 65, that's 65,000 sins that you must pay for. You and I owe God a debt that we can never repay. It would take us for all eternity, and we could never pay God back. Yet God is willing to completely forgive us. He's willing to cancel the debt. Because Jesus Christ paid the price for every wrong thing we've ever done, God is willing to cancel the debt against us. If we'll put our faith in Jesus Christ and trust His cross for our salvation, God will completely forgive us. He will wipe the slate clean. Then God wants us to take the forgiveness that He's offered to us and pass it along to someone else who needs it. God wants us to forgive other people in the same way that he has forgiven us. In fact, it's inconsistent, out of whack, to receive God's forgiveness and not offer it to other people. Whatever other people may have done to us, it's far less than what we've done to God. And he has completely forgiven us. If God is willing to forgive every single one of our sins, then should we not be willing to forgive others for their offenses? Forgiveness is an obligation for those who've been forgiven. We forgive because we are forgiven. It's in the shadow of the cross that you and I are required to forgive. God wants you to cancel the debt of someone else in the same way that he has canceled the debt against you. And if you're thinking that what someone else did to you is too big, too terrible, and too awful to forgive, then look to the cross and remember that Jesus died there to pay the debt for every wrong thing that you've ever done. Remember the mercy that's been shown to you. And then go show that same mercy to other people. Not because they deserve it, but because your heavenly Father commands it. The number of times somebody hurts you isn't the issue. Whether or not they deserve to be forgiven isn't the issue. How you respond to the cross is the issue. And at the cross, you lose your right 
to hang on to resentment and bitterness. C.S. Lewis writes these words, To be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in us. Number two, we forgive because we want to be free. Back to Jesus' story. The king finds out how his forgiven servant has treated his fellow servant. And the king is not happy. Now this unforgiving servant must pay for the rest of his life. And isn't it ironic? The king delivered this servant from prison, and now the servant has acted in such a way that he has placed himself back into prison. Like that servant, we've been rescued, we've been set free, and we've been forgiven. But if we decide not to forgive others and to develop bitterness in our life, we are putting ourselves back into prison. We think we hurt the other person. We punish the other person by not forgiving them. But we end up hurting ourselves. When we refuse to forgive another person, we push the self-destruct button in our own life. You can't afford not to forgive. You can't afford to become bitter, to hold on to anger, to hold on to hurt, to hold on to resentment, puts you in self-destruct mode. When you decide not to forgive and to become bitter, it means that you're going to drag that hurt with you for the rest of your life, and it's going to destroy you. It's going to hurt you. Bitterness hurts you physically. And it's been linked to several sicknesses and diseases. Bitterness hurts you emotionally. When you decide not to forgive someone, you surrender emotional control to that other person. And you allow that other person to dictate the terms of your happiness. Bitterness hurts you socially because to develop a long-term relationship with someone, you must learn to forgive. Bitterness hurts you spiritually because God is asking you to forgive other people in the same way that He has forgiven you. To live in bitterness is to live in torture. To live in forgiveness is to live in freedom. Is there some bitterness in your life? Is there someone you refuse to forgive? If you don't get rid of bitterness, it will poison everything you touch and it will leave you in a pit of despair. True freedom and joy comes when you accept the forgiveness that Jesus offers you, and then extend that same grace to others by forgiving them. The remedy for bitterness is not to get even with the other person. It's to forgive the other person, just as God has forgiven you through Jesus Christ. There may not be a desire within you to forgive. But God can give you the ability to forgive the people who have hurt you. So ask God to help you forgive others just like He has forgiven you. Bitterness keeps you in bondage, but forgiveness frees you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we are forgiven. 
The moment we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Bible says all our sins are forgiven. They're buried in the deepest sea. They're separated as far as the east is from the west. They are gone forever. And thank you that you have forgiven every single one of our sins. And Father, as forgiven people, you are now asking us to forgive others. And Father, if there's one thing that we struggle with, it's forgiving other people. It's the hardest thing to do. And Father, we need your help because we don't want to live in bitterness. We don't want bitterness to take over our life and make us an angry, ugly person. We want to live in freedom. We want to live in joy. We want to live in love. But to do that, we must learn to forgive. So, Father, we need your help. We need you to teach us to be a forgiving person. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. The great news that God has for every person, you can be forgiven. Every one of your sins, wiped away, washed away, erased. That's the great news of the gospel. One day, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you will stand before God, and He will see you through the blood of Jesus Christ, and He will see you as holy, righteous, and blameless, the book of Ephesians says. That's pretty incredible. And when God sees you that way, He will say to you, Welcome home. Welcome to all the blessings that I have for you. Between now and then, whether we experience all of those blessings or not, depends upon our ability to forgive other people. And that's a tough one. It's probably the number one thing that Christians struggle with, forgiving other people. And that's why Jesus told that ridiculous story about the king. <laughs> Jesus is saying, if God is willing to forgive every one of your sins, why can't you forgive the sins of other people? That's what he's asking us to do. And maybe today, God's been speaking to you, and maybe you've been squirming. Maybe you've been uncomfortable because you're thinking, I don't want to forgive. But if you really want to be free, you must learn to forgive. So let me encourage you today when you get home to just get alone with God and say, God, I can't do this on my own. If it's up to me, I'm never going to forgive. I'm going to be like that woman who, who won't forgive her sister over a dollar. That's going to be me. But with your help, I can forgive. If you'll help me, I can forgive. And if you can forgive, you can be free. So let me encourage you to be free for the rest of your life.